the Ministry of Timelines bears no official responsibility for the content of this research. The sequence of events present in this document clearly shows that information is power, and a vast but undetected intelligence network is key for any civilization attempting to survive at a galactic level. Constant blunders by Navy intelligence are a key reason for the downfall of the Republic, and more investigation into this topic is warranted. The Republic census of 2300 showed, for the first time, that humans were now a minority species within the Free Human Republic. Matok now made up 37% of the population, with a smattering of other races pushing humanity under the 50% threshold. This led to a mixed response from humanity, the more xenophobic elements of the populace taking it as a personal attack. However, the Human Xeno Alliance political party celebrated as their membership now swelled. By this time, the once reviled Prosperity Day celebration had taken on a new meaning within the Free Human Republic, becoming a brief annual period of fasting, sobriety and chastity to honour those who, like the great and noble martyr Fred Phillips, had given so much to ensure the lives of hedonistic excess and luxury now enjoyed by the people of Earth. Later that same year, Quapulki, a fringe band of raiders on the edge of hegemony space, reformed into a horde under the great Khan Gan Batan. They did this in the midst of an attack by the Rise of 47 Sentinel Network, a machine intelligence hell-bent on expunging the galaxy of all biological life. Whether the Quapelki Horde would have unified without this direct threat remains to be seen. In a push for more power, the disreputable Senator Max Still made a play at becoming a governor of the Earth Sector, the most important political sector in the Republic. This senator, who had narrowly escaped a charge of treason due to the intervention of a previous president, was entirely unprepared as his plans backfired. This caused the government to reopen the investigation into Max Still on the charge of treason. Some within the Senate made it their mission to expose his purported sins. The following year, allegations were levelled against the notorious Senator Max Still that he was in fact a spy working for the Harappan Empire, a lost colony of humans on the other side of the galaxy. Rumours made clear the character of this Senator. His history of puppy kicking came to light, and this led to a widespread national discussion of the controversial proposal that Senator Still made to legalise puppy beatings. To this day, Max still has denied these rumours or any involvement with that bill. By 2303, the war for Belbos was reaching a conclusion. With the ancient hegemony capital occupied and only a smattering of resistance at the fringes of hegemony space, the Republic's victory was widely thought to be a foregone conclusion. This opinion was further solidified when the Republic won the Second Battle of Torfi Star against the last remaining hegemony forces led by the Great Telforth Empire. It was around this time that the Republic began to adopt mercantile traditions. Health, happiness and hedonism beliefs and traditions were seeping into human culture. A specialist class trained in the arcane art form of dealing with the plebles was beginning to emerge. This merchant class protected the rest of humanity from the underhanded nature of the HHH. At a tidy profit, of course. Far across the galaxy, the Great Khan met his first defeat in the Unabin system. Media reports of this distant threat had generally been ignored by the populace of the Republic. And with his defeat at the hands of an apparently minor power, the Harappan Empire, the Horde was written off almost entirely as any sort of threat. On Earth, people viewed it as a minor skirmish on the edge of the galaxy between backwater peoples. In fact, 
It was a battle of titanic proportions, dwarfing the engagements of even the Belbos Civil War. Had humanity paid closer attention to this conflict, they may have been prepared better for the coming storm of the Harappans. It is only with the privilege of hindsight that we can see how mistaken the Republic's assessment was. Instead of displaying the limited power of the Horde, who had single-handedly beaten back the Riser 47 Sentinel network, this news clearly showed the rising power of the Harappan Empire. The Earth remained blissfully ignorant. In 2304, reports surfaced that the Battle of Unabin had actually led to the death of Great Khan Ganbatan. With his death, the Horde fractured, and in the absence of leadership, the Harappan Empire mopped up any remaining resistance, adding this area of the galaxy to their now growing territory. It was also in 2304 that the war for Belbos officially ended, with an overwhelming human victory. The Free Human Republic celebrated as the old imperial capital was added to the Republic. In a turn of events that shocked the Senate, Max Still managed to weasel his way into the governorship of Belbos on a platform of increased alloy production despite his past agrarian leanings and voting record. Many would also call for him to run as a presidential candidate in the upcoming election, but as of 2305, he had not announced his candidacy. The Brontorok leadership gained association status with the free trade zone of health, happiness and hedonism and the free human republic in 2306. This was in exchange for setting up a lucrative research sharing project on Earth. Human leadership guaranteed that the Brontorok would achieve full market integration within two years. Humanity was beginning to learn from their plebeal cousins in the ways of contractual bamboozlement. Only a few months later, the Free Human Republic Senate voted to accept the vassalization proposal of the Agarian Consortium, a trading group that HHH claimed was in fact an entirely criminal enterprise. This would be labelled as one of the biggest blunders of human diplomacy in history and played a pivotal role in the mistrust that formed between the Republic and her neighbours and allies in the years to come. Health, happiness and hedonism was outraged. Eventually, a deal was reached whereby they would pay the Earth in refined alloys and in exchange, humanity would integrate the criminals into their Republic within two more years robbing them of their independence and preventing them from continuing in their commercial enterprise indefinitely. Through deft political manoeuvring, the Earth managed to profit at the expense of all parties involved. In 2308, the Republic was struck with tragedy, as three of the Republic's top scientists were found dead over the span of a three-month period, perishing due to apparent natural causes. It was suspected by some that the notorious governor Max Still ordered the assassination of the Free Human Republic's scientific elite. A fiery debate erupted within the Senate centering around this governor. Many conspiracy theories emerged from the turmoil. Some suggested a Matok plot to usurp the scientific field from humanity, or a sanctioned operation planned by Max Still to murder current leaders and political opposition. The Senate ordered an investigation into the validity of the latter conspiracy theory. In actuality, their deaths were part of a larger plot conducted by the Harappans as a punishment for the poisoning of Earth and a prelude to war. They murdered Earth's greatest minds. Two years later, in 2310, the newest president of the Free Human Republic died after just three weeks in office. The Human Xeno Alliance's electoral success was very short-lived. Sophie Dubois, leader of the XHA, briefly became president before dying at the relatively young age of 104. This marked the second president to die in office in the short 63-year history of this young nation. Within the Republic, senators debated the likelihood of Governor Max Still having been somehow responsible. 
after a short preliminary hearing conducted without the invitation of the governor, he was found guilty on some counts, but was not stripped immediately of his governorship. Now a household name across the Republic, Governor Still had powerful allies that continued to campaign for his innocence. In 2311, the benevolent interstellar flock, the Brontorok, were given full access to the human plebeble free trade zone, which included the added protection of a joint task force designed to prevent piracy or any other impediments to trade across the customs union. After an extensive research project on the old imperial capital, the scientists leading the investigation revealed that Belbos was a founding member of the First League, an ancient galactic federal nation comprised of a multitude of worlds and species. However, unlike the other members of the League, Belbos were the only species to survive into the present day. Alongside this shocking discovery, surviving imperial records indicated that humanity was in fact the third attempt at uplifting a warlike humanoid species by the Belbos in that area of space. What further secrets of the past would be found on the now ruined capital? Two years after being found guilty of treason, Governor Max Still was finally issued a punishment sentence. To the dismay of the Admiralty, who amongst the primary opponents of the governor and his allegedly anti-human ways, Max Still's only punishment was a 2% pay reduction. The media labelled this a tragic miscarriage of justice. Calls for urgent reform in the Byzantine legal system of the Republic were made. The Due Process Initiative seconded this push for governmental reform. Three of their leading senators recommended putting the system of forms into something of a more solid constitution. In 2313, HHH representatives within the free trade zone began pushing for a communal transport system. Their idea was to implement a network of hyper relays in order to facilitate trade and transportation across the free trade zone. In response, the Earth's negotiators begged for economic assistance if humanity was to have any hope of joining the project. Trade was prospering. The free human republic now stood at the center of a vast network of interconnected economies, which in total rivaled the previous heights of the hegemony of Belbos. Their navy was larger than at any other point in human or hegemony history. The supremacy class battleships represented the greatest weapon the human race had ever produced, and was now being deployed across the Republic's space. All neighbouring threats had been disarmed or eliminated. Humanity felt safe and confident. It came as a great surprise to the people of Earth when, in 2315, the Harappan Empire declared war on the free human Republic. They cited the ruin of Earth as Casus Belli. The free human republic had already lost Earth once to the Belbos. They would not surrender their homeworld again, even to other humans. Following the declaration of war, the Senate streamlined a new piece of legislation, the Mercenary Support War Form. The Senate, in response to Harappan aggression, further expanded the use of mercenary fleets in support of this and further war efforts to protect peace, prosperity and bureaucracy. The war debts were piling up, but the forms of war required everyday humans to make sacrifices. From across the gulf of space, the Nuta offered their assistance. Shipments of refined alloys, crucial in the construction of warships, were offered in exchange for some small concessions and voting alignment within the galactic community, which many humans regarded as an impotent body reminiscent of the decrepit United Nations of Old Earth. The Republic of course accepted, and ordered their diplomats to defer to neuter policy within the community. This agreement was, at the time, regarded as a coup d'etat of foreign policy for humanity, but may in fact have been the most expensive trade deal the human race ever signed. Dwarfing the cost of previous plebeal subterfuges to human sovereignty and supremacy. 
18 months after the official declaration of war, many in the Republic began to think that the Harappan War was nothing more than a political stunt. The distances between the Republic and the Harappans was vast. However, the Empire utilized a little-known tear in the fabric of space, a wormhole, to bring their fleets directly into Republic space. When the Harappan Armada first appeared in Torfi's Star, the Admiralty were in disbelief. Many thought that the Navy was suffering from a systemic sensor issue as the scale of the invasion force dwarfed all previous estimates of Harappan military power. The governor of New Abledon, the only habitable planet in orbit of Torfi's Star, issued an emergency decree, martial law. The next inhabited system, Othana, quickly followed suit. Terms of national service were extended, and conscription across the Republic began. The governments of those outermost systems were well aware that the majority of the human navy were garrisoned around Earth in the core sector, and would not arrive before the Harappans began landing troops on their worlds. New Abledon was invaded first, and millions dead from orbital bombardment, plasma rifle, and old-fashioned bayonet, the planet surrendered. The first line of defense was breached. The Admiralty had hoped that the Empire would then spend time regrouping and consolidating their gains, thus giving the Navy more time to organize and respond. Unfortunately, the Harappans quickly gathered their forces from New Abledon, and after leaving a skeleton garrison behind, began moving to the Othana system. On their arrival in Othana, they met an entirely outmatched and unprepared Brontorok fleet. Due to a communications blunder by Earth's alliance, the Brontorok had been en route to rendezvous with Earth's navy, but instead their main war fleet was lost in a stunning logistical snafu as they faced the entire Harappan armada alone. After passing an emergency poll tax, the FHR bought the contracts on a massive mercenary fleet from a neuter vassal in the Euralian system. They were immediately sent on a course directly for Harappan space. The idea was to put pressure on the Empire and relieve the beleaguered defenders of the Republic. Only a year after the fall of New Abledon, Othana III was invaded by the Harappans. After a few months of fighting and more millions dead, the Empire forces issued a full retreat on the planet and withdrew into orbit. It may have only been a small reprieve, but it was still the first FHR victory in the war. A victory that was celebrated on Earth. The media began reporting this as a possible turning point in the war against the Harappan Empire. In truth, the retreat was not a military defeat for the Harappans, but instead an act of mercy for the people of Othana III. During the defense of Othana III, the human general Wagner, who was helping with the evacuation of the Matok civilians, was killed while shielding a young child, protecting that Matok. The Harappans, shocked by such a high-ranking human officer sacrificing himself for an alien child, temporarily retreated to allow time for civilians to evacuate the planet before they continued with their assault. Within the Free Trade Zone, relations were now being strained. With the loss of their fleet, the Brontrock now felt strong-armed in continuing to join this war effort as the Earth held little meaning for them. Whilst Othana III still remained under nominal control of the Republic, they were entirely besieged by the Empire. Leaving a small garrison in orbit to continue the blockade, the remainder of the Harappan invasion force pressed further into Republic territory, now on a direct path for Earth. In 2319, in response to this clear threat to the heart of the Republic, the Admiralty declared a no-retreat order. Earth must be saved. And to do that, the lives of every man and woman in the Navy were now forfeit, if they would mean the protection of the Earth. Any serviceman found to have retreated in the face of the enemy would receive a summary judgment. 
With this order given, the combined navies of Earth, Hran Hep Homan, and Inak formed up in the Sirius system, only a few star systems away from the Earth. In a great speech to his forces, Grand Admiral Roberto Sanchez decreed that the line must be drawn here, that no Harappan could be allowed to move one more light second in the direction of Earth. Humanity would never surrender their home again. By April 2020, six months later, the Grand Admiral was dead and the Navy had been entirely destroyed. The Harappans had annihilated the Allied fleets in Sirius. The star system had fallen. Terror gripped the Earth as the Navy was swept aside and the path to the capital left open. Only the FTL dampening beacon on the planet of Madragora now prevented the Harappans from attacking Earth immediately. In the Sirius system on Madragora, a fierce battle ensued as the Harappans attacked. General Zhi Yang and the titanic beasts under Republic control tried to hold out in the face of a heavy positronic bombardment. This was truly the last line of defense for the planet Earth. On the other side of the galaxy, the mercenary fleets employed by the Republic took advantage of the lax orders they had been issued. The mercenary group hired to attack the Harappan Empire instead assaulted the Raider Collective Free Space nearby, en route to Harappan space. They killed the families and navies of a rival mercenary group, killing millions of civilians while citing the legal loophole of an unexpected combat situation which was contained within their contract. They used the excuse of following orders to commit atrocities whilst under the pay of the FHR. Humanity had in fact funded a gang dispute. In 2322, General Zhi Yang managed to escape the battle on Sirius to deliver important military information to the Admiralty. Instead of leading the defense of the Sirius system, she then ran and was proclaimed President of the Republic. She was installed in a rushed ceremony, for in the turmoil of the Harappan assault, most legitimate opposition candidates had been unable to stand against her as they could not reach Earth in time for the election. Fearful of the imminent invasion of Earth, the now President Zhi Yang relocated her administration to Belbos. Just as Mandragora fell and the Harappans closed in, she fled Earth. Before leaving, the president gave her final order on the planet. She proclaimed the Emergency Defense Act. Every man, woman, and child were given a gun to defend Earth and drafted into the army. Not a single person left on the planet was technically a civilian. In 2323, the battle for Earth began. General Zhi Zhao, Supreme Commander of the Defense Forces, engaged the Harappans. Outnumbered and desperate, Earth tried to repel the invaders. After settling on Belbos, the New Republic administration began a counter-offensive with the assistance of Brontorok fleets. Beta Stefani in the northeast was captured and human armies were brought in to relieve the siege of Athana III. In 2324, after months of fighting on Earth and over a billion dead, the military high command collapsed. Earth had fallen. The final soldiers had died and the remaining conscripts were now surrendering en masse. Across the Republic, their defeat was widely acknowledged. However, on the new capital, on Belbos, the president refused to admit that the Republic had lost. Two years later, the Senate on Belbos voted in a two-thirds majority to place the blame for the defeat firmly with the Admiralty. As a result, all remaining members of the military high command were executed. They were called deserters and killed under their own no-retreat directive, regardless of whether they had been in an engagement or not. Publicly, the President still refused to admit that the Republic had been defeated. Privately, Republic envoys surrendered to the Harappans unconditionally. The Sol system then became a Harappan protectorate. In 2327, Zhi Yang permanently dissolved the barely established Senate on Belbos. 
and named herself Lord Protector of the Free Human Republic, a position that apparently required a lifetime commitment. Nationalistic zeal swept through the Republic, as the Lord Protector used her firm grip on media outlets to broadcast a constant message of hatred towards the Harappans. The Lord Protector's National Preservation Party was now ruling with an iron fist. Only six months after becoming the Lord Protector, the Free Human Republic was renamed the New Hegemony of Belbos by Zhi Yang, with Belbos as the new capital. Praise Belbos. Due to a massive oversight by the diplomats of the New Hegemony of Belbos, Health, Happiness and Hedonism, and the Benevolent Interstellar Flock, the Harappan Empire was declared a crisis by the Galactic Community in 2328. This machination came at the hands of the Nuta Archivists, as a potential way to stop the Empire's ongoing aggression. A little bit too late, one might say. But now, the galaxy had formally declared war against the Harappan Empire, even though a hard-fought peace had just been achieved. Behind closed doors, the Nuta also assured the Empire that they would not be prosecuting this war, and all borders with Newton vassals would remain safe. On Belbos, the Lord Protector rejoiced, feeling assured that in the chaos of this punitive war against the Harappans, she could quietly reclaim the Earth and thus began a costly rearmament program. In 2331, military robots were commissioned to swell the ranks of the re-envisioned military, as after the fall of Earth, there were now too few humans left in the new hegemony of Belbos to fully replenish the armed forces. In fact, Matok now vastly outnumbered humans in the hegemony, along with other alien elements like the Plebles and the Belbos. The most gracious Lord Protector also announced that year that the parent protocols would be rewritten to become more human. These documents would be dubbed the Overlord Codex. Whilst unpopular, this set of laws proved to be a far more effective governing system than the parent protocols and became widely accepted as the baseline of this autocratic nation's constitution. In a surprising move by the Lord Protector, Evelyn Braith was appointed as Speaker of the Lord Protector in 2332. Her role made her the Chief Propaganda Officer of the New Hegemony of Belbos. This was seen as a confusing move for the Lord Protector to make, as her late father, Senator Ed Braith, was put on trial for treason against the Old Republic alongside Senator Max Still. Although the President at the time, Guy Gagne, had issued Evelyn's father with a pardon, to that day, she had struggled to put her tarnished history behind her. Yet with this new position, she received all the advantages that came from being a member of the dictator's inner circle. This included diplomatic immunity from a majority of hegemony law. Private diplomatic negotiations with the Harappans broke down. After months of attempting to persuade the Harappans to surrender the Earth Protectorate, which was cut off from any Harappan supply lines and deep within hegemony space, the Lord Protector's diplomats, finally growing tired, issued an ultimatum. Surrender the Earth or we will nuke it into dust. The Harappans again refused. In a tense exchange, it was reported that a hegemony diplomat told the Harappan ambassadors to shove a neutron launcher up their thrusters which led to blows between the diplomats. This insult may be the spark that caused the sanctioned crisis war against the Harappans to finally heat up, going from a cold war to something much, much hotter. Though many analysts now argue that this was only an excuse by the warmongering hegemony government to attack the Harappans once more and reclaim Earth no matter the cost. Symbolism was clearly very important to the Lord Protector. By 2333, the Free Trade Zone diplomats to the galactic community finally became aware of Nuta plans to install themselves as community president and then grant their term emergency powers, far outside the normal scope of the galactic community's reach. On the pretense of the apparent galactic crisis, the Harappans, and with Earth's diplomats quietly following the Nuta agenda, 
the rest of the galaxy was fearful of both the Harappans and the Neuter, and a majority supported this amendment. After massive rearmament, the hegemony's economy was on the brink of collapse. The Lord Protector then begged for money and assistance from HHH and the benevolent interstellar flock. Luckily, their allies agreed to step in and help again, in the name of the joint war effort, and sent aid. With the Nuta archivists installing themselves as the self-styled galactic custodians in 2334, their first act was to declare war on the Commonwealth of Soil, labelling them the true threat to the galaxy because they blocked the Nuta from access into Harappan space. Privately, the Nuta once again reassured the Harappans that they had no intention of actually invading Harappan space, though the Harappans were beginning to become very sceptical of their promises. In 2335, the new hegemony of Belbos dropped hundreds of thousands of guerrilla fighters onto the Earth in order to weaken the massive Harappan defensive installations now present there. Once more, the Harappans launched a full-scale invasion from the wormhole in Torfi Star, this time with an even larger fleet than before. They quickly pushed through and into Othana, where the new hegemony had stationed a preliminary defensive force. This force was primarily composed of Newton mercenaries, but in a stunning defeat, all of the mercenaries were killed or fled. Some reports of the battle instead suggest that the mercenaries stood down and let the Harappans advance, before returning to Nuta space unmolested. Given how events unfolded across the galaxy in the following decades, it seems likely that this was in fact the reality of the situation. Regardless, spirits remained high in the hegemony's high command. Some even looked at the positive side of their defeat in Othana, as that does save them some money. Overall, the Battle of Othana was a complete loss. The new hegemony of Belbos then prepared their next line of defense to repulse the Harappans. In 2339, the benevolent interstellar flock committed mass suicide and replaced their now dead population with an army of near identical machine automatons. These cyber synthetic bodies claimed to be a continuation of the Brontorok species, possessing the memories and traits of the entire species before their suicide. But many across the galaxy fiercely disagreed. The Nuta, the Galactic Custodians, issued threats and warnings to the new hegemony of Belbos for their association with the Brontorok. By 2340, the already unhinged and substance-addicted Lord Protector had reportedly suffered a full mental breakdown as her allies began turning against her. The citizens and some factions within the hegemony began to call for the Lord Protector's replacement. This rhetoric was harshly put down by the Speaker of the Lord Protector and her minions. Meanwhile, General Roman Dragomirov, commanding the invasion of Earth, died. It was reported that he fought valiantly, and even in the face of death, he did follow procedure, filling the correct forms in order to jump 200 feet into the air and scatter himself over a wide area. However, this would not signal a defeat for the new hegemony. After six years of escalating engagement on the Earth, in 2341, the Lord Protector claimed victory. As she once more walked upon the cradle of humanity, shielded from the now constant harsh radiation storms and violent bursts of acid rain by force fields, many were left wondering how long the hegemony could hold the planet. The single-mindedness of their campaign, pouring all of the resources of the hegemony into retaking Earth and ignoring all other battlefronts, may have in fact cost them the war. Harappan forces that had pushed through the northern wormhole were now once again at Sirius. Human forces had retreated to Earth in the hope of defending the planet in one final stand. It is thought that the Lord Protector was expecting further assistance from her allies in the HHH and robotic benevolent interstellar flock, along with support from the rest of the community. However, that support never materialized. Only a few months later, the fleets above Earth were defeated. Again, Ji Yang retreated from the planet and issued the Emergency Defense Act. 
she claimed that the new hegemony would fight for every molecule on the planet. In 2342, the Lord Protectors in a circle called out her clear and near constant state of intoxication due to substance abuse. Some have suggested that with the loss of the war and under the weight of her apparent failure for a second time, she fell into the dark trap of substance abuse to numb the pain of this failure. Many beers lost their life that day. The cowardice movement was established in 2344 amidst a vote to sue for peace. The Lord Protector called her upper council and over half of the public cowards. This label was then worn proudly and it became popular amongst the public to wear buttons saying I am a coward and better a coward than dead. Ji Yang's iron grip on the hegemony was beginning to slip. The next year, Earth surrendered for a second time. The Lord Protector made no public statements on this event. On Belbos and across the new hegemony worlds still under her control, any news of current affairs was violently suppressed. Three years later, in 2348, after much debate in the galactic community, the Nuta finally managed to repeal the crisis legislation and the war against the Harappans came to an end. The Nuta then claimed that in order to prevent such a bureaucratic travesty as the crisis war from repeating itself, they did require additional powers to safeguard sentient life across the galaxy. A majority of the community supported this reformation in the hopes of securing a lasting peace. The Nuta archivists then established the Galactic Empire, a rebranding of their now extensive and permanent emergency powers. Meanwhile, the Harappans established the Earth Restoration Project, a science directorate with the sole task of restoring Earth to the garden it once was. At present, the previous paradise is in fact a desolate tomb world. Centuries of industrial pollution and decades of modern warfare had reduced the planet to an inhospitable wreck, with life outside of the shielded cities completely impossible. Restoring this world would be a daunting task. Far away on Belbos, the now self-styled Empress Zhi Yang, Empress of the new hegemony of Belbos, refused to acknowledge that anything was wrong, or in fact that Earth was even lost. She continued to refer to that area of space and the Earth Restoration Project as the Sol Satrapy. Removing herself from public life, the NHB continued on without its western space and claimed to be a direct continuation of the old hegemony of Belbos. The Matok Free States, on the far edge of hegemony space, then managed to remain free of any external control save the Newton Emperor. In fact, they even attempted to pay the Harappans their tribute, but the Harappans were only confused, not understanding the intentions of the Matok envoys and their previous subservient relationship within the hegemony. Taking advantage of the situation, the Matok instead claimed that it was all one big translation error, handed over a few of their personal items, such as a clipboard and some shoes, as gifts, and left as quickly as possible. Would the freedom of the Matok people last? And what would the future hold for this galaxy? With peace balanced on the edge of a knife. This concludes our analysis of the fall of the free human republic in this timeline. Please refer to the next chapter of this report for further details on the Belbos timeline.